Um, again, Amber and I are part of the Port Susan Bay restoration team, and we work alongside Randy Shaw and Emily Howe, as well as Heather Cole at TNC. And we're also working closely on this project with um, our design engineers at ESA, Dan Elephant and Sky Miller. And we're here to provide an overview of the, an excavation method that we've been piloting at Port Susan Bay, which everyone's been hearing about. And there's all the murmur that's called blasting. Um, and we're here to go over the results of the test blast that we conducted back in August um, with our, block, our blasting contractors, McCallum Rock Drilling um, and the associated monitoring group, Amony Martin and Associates. So Amber and I will do our best to convey the results of the blast. However, since we're not blasting experts ourselves, we may need to check in with our blasting contractors if you have really technical questions, but we're happy to do that. And um, so please do ask questions because um, we're hoping your feedback will help us get the most out of testing this blasting method at Fort Susan Bay. All right. So I'm gonna start with a quick overview, just in case anyone in the room hasn't been following the Fort Susan Bay project closely over the past few years. So TNC's Port Susan Bay Preserve was purchased in 2001 and initial restoration took place in 2012, reconnecting what was agricultural land to the bay by removing a seafront dike and creating two outlet channels. And five years of post-project monitoring and um, monitoring as well as some additional modeling has shown that additional restoration actions are needed to maximize the estuary's habitat potential for salmon um, as well as other species. And so the, the site currently lacks connectivity to the Silgamish Sil River at the south and connection to the bay is also limited. Um, also due to compaction from agricultural activities, the channels are not expected to develop in the estuary for 80 years if we don't intervene. So that's why TNC has been pursuing funding for permitting for a second phase of restoration at the site to increase fresh water flow, create, um, and salmon access to the site by removing old dike impediments, creating distributary channels from the river and carving channels to increase fish habitat. So while we have a wider restoration project that includes site actions across the whole 150 acre footprint, as well as um, work closely with the tribes to ensure connectivity between Zizba 2 next door and our site, today we'll just be focusing on the blasting aspect of the project. So why don't we, um, why were we pursuing blasting? Why blasting? Well, during our design process, the idea of using explosives to carve estuary channels was presented as a potential way to reduce project costs um, and, and ecological impact at an already vegetated inundated site. And blasting is not a method with an established record of use in inundated wetland systems. So our approach from the beginning was to consider a method um, um, of considering the blasting method was to start with a calibration test blast that could serve as a learning opportunity for the estuary restoration community. Next slide. And using the blasting method involves bearing the amounts of dynamite um, involves bearing the amounts of dynamite powder um, that is packed and buried in different patterns at different depths to achieve different design specifications. And once detonated, that series of small explosions from those buried charges create connected craters that form a channel. So the map here shows our original proposed design plan where we'd use traditional excavators to dig the larger primary tidal channels, which are in blue. And then blasting would be used to create three different size channels. So the three different type size channels, um, we identify as blast type channels one, two, and three. So blast type channel one, um, are the channels in pink that you can see on the map. Those are the larger eight to 10 foot wide channels that are two to four feet deep. And then blast type two channels are in red. If you squint, you can see the difference between the red and the purple or pink. Um, those are four to six foot wide channels that are two to four feet deep. And then finally, there are blast type three channels, which are in yellow. You can see the brighter yellow ones um, on the east side property, as well as the ones that Amber's pointing to um, within the site. So those yellow um, blast type three channels are four, also four to six feet wide, but just two to um, one to two feet deep. So after the test blast, we are reconsidering the original blast plan that we have here, um, but when we'll discuss that um, a bit more later. Next slide. So in order to proceed with the test blast, we went through federal, state, and local permitting process. Um, we developed a biological assessment and received a letter of concurrence from, for ESA from NOAA, 
and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We also completed nationwide 27 permit package with a cultural resource memo for the Army Corps. We also went through state and county permitting. With the state, we did the HPA or the hydraulic permit approval process. And then for county permitting, we did a flood hazard permit, um, a land disturbing activities permit, as well as a shoreline exemption permit. All in all, the permitting process took about two years. Next slide. And in the years leading up to the test blast, we presented on the method to um, a technical advisory committee that we had gathered. We also held a special session for the SLS, like Sarah just mentioned. We also met with members of the flood control district on site to talk more about the method and provided updates to the Stillaguamish IT. Um, also, before the blast, we alerted um, our local partners and delivered notices to neighbors. And while we weren't, a um, we weren't able to have a large group attend the blast for safety reasons, we did invite members of the flood control district as well as um, staff from county, state, and federal, as well as tribal natural res resource agencies to attend the blast. So next I'll pass it to Amber and she's gonna describe a bit more about the test blast day um, and the monitoring results. Okay, thanks Molly. So. Um... Apologies, my dog might bark for a second. Back in August, we conducted the test blast on 100 linear feet of channel in the northwestern portion of the site, which is this yellow square right here. We made sure that the channel was connected to this one of these major outlets here um, so that it could fill and dewater with the rest of the site during high and low tides. This is a photo of the day before the blast. So our engineer staked out 100 linear feet of channel that would be um, blasted. We are standing looking south towards some vegetation here, and it gives you kind of a good idea of what this area looked like before um, the test blast occurred. And here is the blast loading. So um, McCallum Rock Drilling did the blast and the setup for the blast took a few hours. We had the blasting crew on site with about 16 people. And these blast holes were created using auger drills to specify depth. And you can see them using these, um, these drills here. As you can imagine, this was quite a bit of work bringing all the equipment from the parking lot to the center of the site, hand drilling blast holes, clearing the equipment, loading the holes, um, clearing the site prior to the test blast. Um, it took longer, I think, than we anticipated. Um, for future efforts, finding a way to move people and equipment through the marsh will be key to making this process more efficient. And this is the blast loading diagram. Um, there isn't a lot of precedent for blasting in this soft clay sediment, so we needed to develop a series. We needed to develop a series of mini experiments to help us understand how different powder factors interacted with the substrate. And so, if you look um, at the diagram, it starts with a high powder factor and gets lower uh, as you go. And this is just squished to fit the page. It's actually supposed to be one straight line. Um, and the very end of it is this, um, those single hole um, blasts right there. Uh, each of these segments was designed to have a delay between each treatment to recalibrate the monitoring equipment um, between blasts. And this is how the monitoring was set up. Um, once we had that blast pattern to test the different factors, we put monitoring sensors throughout the blast area um, to monitor over air pressure, adjacent in-water pressures and ground vibrations. These measurements were then used to develop attenuation models, which I will talk about in a couple of slides. Um, so what we're looking at here, the red dots are ground measurements and the blue dots are water measurements. And that red line here shows the blast location. But as you can see, we've kind of, uh, these were set up uh, at increasing distance from the site. So here's a whole bunch right here and then out to the dike and all the way out to um, the Lurvik farm off of Bow Road. And we made sure that we were blasting out of water at the lowest tide possible and within the fish window to avoid impacts to fish. It's trickier to mitigate impacts to birds. Luckily, uh, August is a month in the estuary where we don't have um, that huge number of migratory waterfowl that we see in the winter or shore, shorebirds and most of the resident marsh birds are finishing up with nesting or, or, or finished nesting. Um, 
one of the things that we did was we used firecrackers in the vegetation. Most of the blast was out of the vegetation, but the small portion that was vegetated, we put firecrackers in that were set to go off right before the blast to um, scare away any secretive marsh birds, marsh wrens um, that might be hanging around. Uh, we also learned that trying to haze purple martins with a drone is ineffective because they're really protective of their nest boxes and they um, they actually tried to attack the drone. So um, we made sure that we were monitoring all of the purple martin nesting boxes before the blast and directly after the blast. Um, and we didn't observe any mortalities or changes in behavior with the martins, which was good. Um, it kind of reassured us. And this is the blast. So here's an aerial of the actual blast, which was truthfully larger than we had originally expected. The blast was intended to be a type one. If you remember the table that Molly showed uh, eight to 10 feet in width, and it ended up being about twice that, 16 feet across. And um, I'll explain why that happened in a couple of slides. So this is what 100 feet of newly created channel looks like. Um, right after a blast. And we've got a little engineer back here for scale. Okay, so um, these are the side-by-sides of before and after the blast. And to the left, we have before and after with that, um, that charge pattern that I showed you uh, overlaid. And then we have it on the right without, although you can still see the blasting crew and um, those, those hand-drilled holes there. So in general, um, we were excited by the results of the test blast. And I think other restoration practitioners that came to the blast were also um, encouraged by the results. These aerial photos show the blast footprint really well. Um, this method certainly reduces the impact on the marsh surface as opposed to traditional excavation. Um, and that's important because this project will be taking place on established marsh, really nice vegetative growth. And to use this method, um, no heavy equipment would re be required for those smaller channels that we pointed out. Um, and an additional benefit, and you can see it really well in these photos, is the way that the sediment splays over the marsh surface. This allowed a lot of that vegetation to be uncovered within a couple tidal cycles as opposed to a couple seasons. And it made that habitat available for wildlife immediately without that recovery time. Uh, additionally, they were able to pre uh, achieve predicted depth for those channels and these um, textured channel edges. And then this photo shows the elevation gradient of the blast footprint. And I just think it's a, I think it's a cool photo. And it also, um, it's something that we're gonna continue to monitor um, those dimensions of the channels throughout the year. And here are some more recent channel photos. So these photos are from late September and you can see how the channel has really softened and slumped a bit more over time. Um, it's unfortunate because this is a dead end channel. And so it's difficult to know if the way it's being shaped would be the same as when water was freely um, flowing through it. Uh, we assume that full water flow would prevent a lot of the fill in and slumping, but um, yeah, it's just hard to tell with the dead end channel. Um, so unfortunately, when the test blast detonated, 17, 72 of the holes in the first five segments detonated at one time or sympathetically detonated. And this was, um, we've been told, due to the wet mud conditions. And this type of detonation was not expected or predicted, but the high energy of the explosives created this sort of a detonation shockwave um, that it caused the, all of these holes to uh, detonate instantaneously together, which caused that larger than expected um, blast. This left only two holes at the end of the segment five to detonate as planned on separate time delays. And we've kind of blown that up um, right here to the right. You can see these two holes at the end here. And what this means is that those sensors that we placed uh, were not able to pick up the data from the different treatment sections of blast as planned since they didn't have a chance to recalibrate between blasts. However, we can use the data from those remaining two holes in the fifth segment um, to create attenuation models because those sensors were able to recalibrate and provide reliable data. Um, in addition, 
to, oh, sorry, in addition to being able to create attenuation models, this test blast provided crucial information about the degree of confinement provided by the sediment substrate in containing um, air and water pressure compared to typical rock blasting. So this blast induced pressure and vibration amplitudes that travel away from the detonation are really dependent on confinement. And so it's very important to understand um, how, that, how that happens at, at your site and your substrate. And what we discovered is that the confinement in mud is pretty similar to confinement in rock in terms of air and water pressure. And now we can use that information to refine future blasting efforts. Okay. Attenuation models. So attenuation models are important tools for blasters when planning and executing blasting activities to protect structures. At our site, we were concerned with protecting wildlife. So our test blast was designed with those various sensors that we showed on the map placed at increasing distances from the blast to record and model the attenuation, also known as the decrease in measurements, and to develop a set of equations uh, fit to that data trend. And attenuation models will allow blasters to know the correct powder factors to use to achieve the precise channel dimensions while keeping factors like pressure and vibrations within safe limits for wildlife. Uh, we were able to generate attenuation models for water pressure, over air pressure, and peak particle velocity. Okay. Understanding how the blast would impact wildlife that was using the marsh already was particularly important to our team. And there's only a few studies that have correlated blasting metrics like pressure and vibration um, on fish and wildlife. For our test blast, the attenuation models created from those two holes of explosives um, can help blasters design a blast to protect fish and birds based on what information is available in the literature. So I'm gonna go through an example of how we would use one of those attenuation models. Uh, we could use a study from 2013, which looked at blasting effects on juvenile salmonids in Alaska. Uh, that led them to decide that an in-water PSI limit of 7.3 was safe. Now that we have our attenuation model, we can see that at our site, if we use between 1 to 1.5 pounds of dynamite powder per cubic yard, and then we keep the blasting 50 feet away from open water, we can maintain a water PSI of 1.71 which is way below that 7.3 PSI limit used in Alaska that they were considering safe for juvenile fish. Um, for birds, there really is no predetermined safe limit for air pressure or vibrations. One of our main concerns would be um, nest abandonment or forced fledging changes in behavior that would impact um, nestlings. And so for future blasting, we know there needs to be a large distance from the blasting and from any known nesting locations. We know that we can use things like firecrackers in the vegetation before um, a blast is detonated to haze birds that are hiding out in the vegetation. And although we were disappointed that we weren't able to gather as much data as we hoped for, we learned a lot from this test blast. And we're going to be heading into the next phase of this project much more prepared and with a lot more information um, that we need to reduce the amount of impact to the site. And I'm going to give it back to Molly to talk about future blasting plans. Thanks, Amber. So because we consider this test blast to be a success in many respects, and we've received positive feedback from lo local restoration practitioners, we would like to apply for permits to continue testing the method at site. However, instead of blasting type one, two, and three channels, we'd like to try out testing just type two and three channels, or the red and yellow lines on the map, which are those four to six foot wide channels that require much less powder factor. And any additional blasting that we would do would be seen as a second iteration of testing and understanding if we can achieve sinuosity and successful, successfully utilize attenuation models to calculate the correct amount of powder to use for those smaller channels. We'd also want to see how those smaller channels do with spreading dirt across the marsh plain, which is something that we saw during the test blast and really liked. Um, and if after additional tests of smaller channels, uh, blasting of smaller channels, we decide the blasting method isn't effective or working the way we thought, we could, we would, we could move forward um, with using excavators. Some of the reasons we've decided to only blast the smaller channels is because that is where we can see gaining the most ecological benefit. Um, as Amber was just explaining, we can see the ecological benefits of using blast blasting as you can reduce the footprint 
footprint of the excavator impact on the marsh. So if we use excavators instead of blasting for the smaller type two and three channels, the excavator would have to move along the edges of the channel, causing compaction and um, damaging existing vegetation. However, for blast type one channels, the primary and primary channels, the excavators can actually move within the width of the channel, decreasing the need um, to cause compaction around the channels. So blasting type two and three channels would have the most ecological benefit. And it's also because after the test blast, we have a better idea of what the blasting method will cost. When we first started exploring the idea of blasting back in 2019, the world looked a bit different. Um, and with the increase of uh, increase in, increased costs of explosives due to wartime, as well as um, the number of people it takes to execute the blasting method, the cost of blasting is higher than using traditional excavators or even amphibious excavators. So if we blast type two and three channels, um, the overall project cost would increase by about 100,000. Um, but blasting type one channels would increase our project by significantly by significantly more, and we wouldn't be getting as much of the ecological benefit as um, I just explained. So we're still planning to conduct the full um, construction project in two phases over two summers, and are in conversations about the best way to proceed with construction, sequencing, test, continuing the test blasting with the use of amphibious ex excavators, as well as the construction work that could be initiated by the tribe next door. Um, down the line. So if we receive permits and we're able to continue testing the blasting method, we would choose a channel to start with that is well away from the dike. Um, and, um, and any blasting near the dike would not occur unless the tribe proceeds with removing the dike that separates our two properties. So again, the aim of this process, next slide, Amber. <laughs> Sorry, forgot to tell you. Um, again, the aim of this process has been to test a method of excavation and provide results to the community for mutual learning. So please let us know if you have any questions or ideas. That's all the content we have. We'd love to open it up for questions or comments um, about the test blast. Feel free to put your questions in the chat, or you can just go ahead and unmute and ask a question when you're ready. I have a question. I, I was curious. I mean, you did you said it was about 100 feet, no, or something like that for this. How much of this area is the intent? to open up for channels and such, um, if you get everything you'd like here. Could you repeat the question a little bit louder? Oh, sure. Sorry, um, I don't know if it's my speaker. Amber, if you could be here. <laughs> I think I'm just, the size of your test obviously is, is mm -hmm. small enough that you knew if it was working or not, but I'm wondering how much of this area would you want to blast or open up to channels? So um, currently in the design plan, we have um, 1,300 feet of type two channel and 2,500 about 2,500 feet of type three channel. Um, so those are the four to six foot wide um, and like one to four foot deep channels. Um, and so yeah, that's the the total linear feet. Um, of channel that we could blast, but again, our plan is to start with um, another test blast, essentially, to see if um, you know we use the attenuation models and use a, a much less powder factor to create um, those smaller channels, and then go from there. Um, kind of make an iter iterative process out of it. Amber, do you have something to add? No, I think that was good. If you want um, a visual, I can I can share the show again to. Um show you what channels are going to be blasted if that's helpful. I always like visuals that helps yeah. me. Okay. <laughs> Let me get that back up there for you. But we can take more questions in the meantime. This one in the chat. Is it Joycelyn? Did I, did I say your name properly? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, we asked Joycelyn, great. Um, if the blast is not going to be sequenced delayed in the way you thought due to the wet conditions, does that mean the number of charges will be reduced for any future blasts? 
Yeah, that's our understanding is that um, the blast contractors, um, like Amber was saying, will use the attenuation model. So we know um, that we can dial back the amount of powder that's packed into each individual um, packet of explosives. Um, and they'll also work to reduce that potential of sympathetic detonation. So whether that means putting them further apart or sequencing them in different ways, um, they can they can prevent the sympathetic detonation. Right. Remember? Yeah, that's my understanding of it. I think that explained it well. Um, I just shared screen so you can see um, the channels that Molly was pointing out would only be the type two or type three, which are red or yellow. That helps you. It's actually, when you're looking at it, it's not a whole lot compared to um, the other types of channels. Great. Scott put a creative idea for funding in the chat. Um, since it's a bit more expensive than <laughs> originally hoped, maybe it could fund the project by auctioning off the opportunity for someone to press the button for the explosion. <laughs> Good idea. I, you ha I think you have to have a pretty serious license to be the button presser. <laughs> that would be. Yeah, there's a not a lot then. of talk about pressing the button, and it was it wasn't as cool as we thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> you also have to have a really bellowing voice because you have to yell when about like five minutes before and then right before the blast goes off. <laughs> Another question. Well, if the if the voice is, is an issue, I'm I'm pretty good at projection, <laughs> so that that wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> uh, Molly, I was curious if from the outreach you did in advance, was there any um, concerns from the neighbors after the fact, or did they reach out after the blast? Did they even know that it was happening? What was the response? I think Amber can answer that one. She had some conversations after the blast. Yeah. Um, well, we were fortunate that we're pretty far out there. And so there's not a lot of neighbors. Um, and then what, what used to be known as the Thurmond property used to have folks on it uh, right to the east of the site. And that's not the case anymore. So really the closest residence was where we put one of those monitoring sensors, uh, the Lervik farm. And, um, you know, we talked to Stuart before and after the blast and he did feel a little something and I think that was due to that sympathetic detonation. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't anything crazy. And we had to reach out to him. He wasn't super concerned, but he's a pretty chill guy. Um, so that's kind of how that went. I anticipate with less powder factor that he probably won't feel anything. So David asked, would you need to combine efforts of ex exaction, extract, exaction and blasting to complete the project or will the blasting alone start the natural ch channel creation work? Maybe uh, he meant excavation. Yeah, he, right. yeah the idea is to use um, both traditional excavators, likely amphibious excavators, and the blasting method. So, um, and to fully carve the channel network. Um, and from there, you know, you expect the natural system, once you get more of that water flowing through the system, some of the channels might change, but getting that water flowing brings the, the additional hydraulic energy that allows the site to recover um, and create channels. And in, in terms of sequencing, um, it would be our desire to do the um, the traditional or the amphibious excavation first to open up those areas for cultural resource monitoring, um, as opposed to doing the blasting first so that you're able to get monitors on site um, because monitoring the blasting was a little bit more challenging than using traditional excavators. So in sequencing, we're also thinking about um, cultural resources. Heather? Thanks, Molly. Um, one one issue we've heard from from partners is about whether or not blasting can really save costs. Um, so I'm just wondering at this phase, um, are you seeing uh, cost savings with using blasting for the type two, three channels 
versus using excavation um, for all three. Yeah, so that's kind of what I was I was trying to explain at the end. Um, but thanks for asking for clarification. So blasting, it turn as it turns out, is not um, is not more cost effective than using traditional excavators. It's it is more expensive. Um, like I was saying, because of I think the cost of explosives have gone up um, in the past year um, due to wartime um, activities, and you know it really took. Um, a relatively large crew to get to like drill the auger and get all the blast material out to the site. Um, again, like Amber said, we're going to try to see what we can do to help um, reduce the effort needed to get explosives out to site. Um, so that you know could end up slightly reducing the cost if they can get it going quicker than they had than they did for the test blast. But um, yeah, in, in general, it's it's looking more expensive. So for if we blasted all of the type two and three channels um, that are currently in our blast plan, it would increase project project costs by a hundred thousand um, dollars. But that's why another reason why we're not looking right now to blast type one channels because that would significantly increase the cost um, of our project because those type one channels are um, the eight to ten foot wide channels and would take um, um, yeah more explosives, more time and the, the overall project cost increased pretty significantly. So, um, and like I was saying, you don't get the, the ecosystem benefit um, like you do with doing the smaller channels where you're actually, you know, removing and reducing the need for the excavator footprint on the marsh um, because the, the excavators would have to be moving all around those type two and three channels um, to do the digging. Whereas with the type one channels, the excavators can move within the footprint of the channel, um, reducing the need for as much excavator movement around the channel, compacting plants and um, vegetation and, and, and the sediment. Thanks, Molly. Sure. Morgan? Um, Thanks for your presentation here. It's super interesting to, to hear more. Um, and feel free to table this if this is like not part of this conversation. But um, I was thinking with the Silly Tribe Zizaba 2 that's about to be, you know, designed and hopefully constructed relatively quickly. Have you looked at how that site is likely to interact with this other site and whether the additional excavation um, is really going to be necessary if you have more potential flow going um, you know through the site and uh, accessing your site that right now has been diked off? So um, hopefully that makes sense. Number yeah. <laughs> um, no, that totally makes sense. Um, we uh, we've been working a lot with the Stiligwamish and Tulalip tribes. Um, we have the same design engineers, and we're doing coordinated modeling to make sure that the flow paths coming from their site um, work synergistically with our site. And in fact, if we if we didn't prepare our site for that increased flow. Um, we would kind of undo that um, established marsh that's already there because there wouldn't be any channels to accept that extra water, right? So it would just flow over and cause scour. And so um, we're definitely working um, in sync with with this other restoration project to make sure that they're they're working as one large piece when every when all of the different phases are completed. I don't know if Molly or Randy have anything else to add. Okay. But if you have follow up questions or, um, you know, something um, that you want to know further, Morgan, please reach, reach out or ask the follow up. Um, hey, Molly, Amber, it's Laurel. I wanted to double check. I think you said that you might put together a like you know, lessons learned or best practices or guide to blasting in, in the mud in the estuary like this. Is that, did I remember that right? Is there some sort of kind of written um, account that will come out? And is that something, do you have any 
thoughts or timelines or anything about something like that? Um, we have the blasting reports from the blasting engineers, as well as um, additional reports from the monitoring experts. And so, um, yeah, we we would be happy to try to, you know, condense those into um, kind of a package and kind of talk through the additional components of blasting, like the permitting process um, that we had to take, as well as um, kind of our take on, um, you know, the results. Um, so yeah, any, if you have feedback on um, or suggestions on what we might include in that, um, please let us know. We, we haven't started that, um, but it's a good idea. And I know something that we've, we've talked about um, and yeah, still have in mind. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, I know that there's so much information here. It was, it was just yeah. um, a hope to think a little bit more about something digestible like that, that could maybe be incorporated into some future efforts. So thanks. That sounds great. And I think too, Laurel, um, if we do end up getting permitted and pursuing this second phase of pest blasting um, and getting even more information, that would be a really good thing to write up, you know, for future restoration projects, as you're saying, something that's easy to reference. Exactly. Yeah. I can imagine this would be um, a project idea that others might like to know more about and see how you did it and all the you know, the good bad the ugly of it would be important information and you could you could really provide a wealth of insight and perspective that would be so valuable like you know this presentation but um maybe even something more one day just imagining that that would be really useful yeah, yeah. 